very excited uh, unit for to hear your testimony and have a conversation with you uh, about your positions. Uh, my name is Lynn Simons and I'm the chief judge of the second judicial district court in the state of Nevada. And I'm honored to be here. I have participated in We the People for years, um, not quite as long as my colleagues, but at different levels. And this is just such a privilege and honor to be here today. No pun intended on the privilege. Um, we, I want you to take a deep breath right now and focus. And um, what we'll do is we will pause that time, as Ms. Tinder said, because we want to hear every word. How you doing? I'm Peters. I've seen you somewhere around town. Obviously, here, law professor at the University of Richmond. Good to see you all. We're going to have a good conversation today. Obviously, as you all know, I've been doing this for a couple of decades since before any of you all were born. Uh, so that just makes me old. But I'm sure we'll have a good <laughs> conversation about today's Constitution as well as yesterday's Constitution. Yeah, uh, my name is Judge. Uh, my name is Joe Stewart, and <laughs> as, as Judge Simons has pointed out, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, been been involved with the people for quite a while. Uh, very much enjoyed. I teach in the political science department at Clemson University in South Carolina, and uh, we're here to listen to what you have to say. And uh, we relax. We're going to have fun today and we're going to learn from you. Now, would you uh, introduce yourselves and your teacher? Yeah, thank you. I'm Quinn Cast. I'm Lexi Pasternak. I'm Ben Dickinson. I'm Kirby Westerfield, and we are all seniors at Maggie Walker Governor's School, representing Virginia, and our teacher is Mr. Samuel Olmschneider. So I believe that this announcement's going to go off in one minute. Um, do you have any idea how long it goes? We're not sure. Probably not not very long. A few seconds. Hopefully. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. Because I have it 12.05 right now, and I was just wondering if I should pause or start reading the question. Go ahead. You can, you can go ahead. Okay. All right. Unit four, how have the values and principles embodied in the Constitution shaped American institutions and practices? Question two. Dr. Smith, at this time, would all odd numbered classrooms at the study hall please come to the Honor Council Assembly in the auditorium? Would all odd numbered classrooms and study hall students please come to the auditorium for the assembly? That's it. All right. Question two. The president, quote, ought to communicate such papers as the public good would permit and ought to refuse those the disclosure of which would injure the public. Quote, do you agree or disagree that the executive can withhold or disclose information at his or her discretion? To what extent, if any, has the claim of executive privilege expanded presidential power since its inception? And are the constitutional powers that enable the other two branches to counter executive privilege claims sufficient? Why or why not? You may begin. So often, <laughs> suffered from the want of and dispatch that the Constitution would have been inexcusably defective if no attention had been paid to those objects, argued John Jay in Federal 64. Thus, the framer set out to create an energetic executive with the power to ensure the new nation's safety. Keeping sensitive information secret was part of this original vision, but the framers also conceived of a system of checks and balances. Thus, while the founders drew on the powerful British precedent of crown privilege, they also worked to keep the privileged president from becoming an unchecked tyrant. President Washington first put this vision into practice in 1792. Washington cemented the principle of secrecy around sensitive national security matters by refusing the House's request for records surrounding General St. Clair's defeat, but he was eventually forced to relent to Congress in part. The scope and power of the executive branch has grown since Washington's day, and with them, the extent and significance of executive privilege. It is true that new national security issues and the need for candid communication necessitate greater secrecy. However, claims to privilege have become not the exception, but an overextended rule. A turning point occurred during the Watergate scandal, when the Nixon administration asserted that executive privilege may be exercised without reference to a specific Article II power and is non-justiciable. Though the Supreme Court and U.S. v. Nixon declined to endorse Nixon's view, that view has influenced the expansion of the privilege under subsequent presidents. 
Like Nixon, Clinton invoked executive privilege repeatedly in an effort to preserve his public image. He refused to turn over documents in the ethics review of Agriculture Secretary Mark Espy and sidestepped scrutiny over incriminating memoranda related to anti-drug policy. George W. Bush further pushed the boundaries of the privilege to be, to be valid even after presidents have left office with Executive Order 13233. This trend compromises the presidential role envisioned by the framers, one where an executive's strength and energy is met with an equally strong system of accountability in Congress and the courts. Such traditional checks on executive privilege have all but disappeared during the Trump administration. For example, Attorney General William Barr refused to comply with subpoenas surrounding investigations of the 2016 election, claiming blanket executive privilege for all his interactions with the president. This is particularly troubling because the Attorney General oversees law enforcement and must be accountable to congressional oversight. However, the other branches are not always powerless in the face of executive privilege claims. Congress may hold individuals in contempt for refusing to disclose information, which has been an important means of leverage over the executive branch. In 1983, when Ann Burford refused to release EPA documents concerning enforcement of the federal Superfund law, she was charged with contempt despite White House claims of executive privilege, and the executive was eventually forced to turn over the material. However, contempt is often rendered ineffective due to statutory exemptions and a heavy reliance on the Justice Department to bring criminal charges. Judicial efforts to overcome claims of privilege have also found mixed success. Federal courts can use their Article III powers to decisively resolve controversies over subpoenas of the executive for valid legislative or judicial purposes. In Trump v. Mazars, the Supreme Court endorsed the House's subpoena of Donald Trump's financial records and created a balancing test which weighs the legislative purpose against the privacy burden imposed on the president. Unfortunately, court hesitancy on the issue is the norm, and when cases do arise, deference to the state secrets privilege and lack of practices like in-camera review tip the scales towards the president. The vast majority of executive privilege cases are addressed informally with a nebulous bargaining process. Congress and the courts must put aside their short-term political interests and overcome traditional barriers to decisively check executive privilege and limit its coverage. Only in this way can the vision of the framers be restored, that, in the words of Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, presidents are not kings. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you know, there's a theory that, and it's often quoted, that um, power corrupts and absolute power absolutely corrupts. What specific checks does Congress have available um, other than uh, the executive's use of subpoena power? I think first we look to the taxing and spending clause in Article 1, Section 8, that if necessary, Congress could um, take away funding from the executive branch. And the power of the purse is also where Congress derives its investigative purpose from when it's investigating agencies. So that fits right into the goal of um, effective oversight to maximize efficiency and government spending. In addition to this, uh, co the Congress and specifically the Senate can uh, delay uh, uh, confirming appointments made by the president in order to use that as leverage for uh, the president handing over documents that they uh, claim under executive privilege. Okay. You've correctly noted the growth of executive branch and executive power. Would it, would it make, is there any use of distinguishing between executive privilege and presidential privilege? And is that possible and would it do us any good in dealing with the kinds of problems you've noted? Um, yeah, I think that we can look to the idea of unitary executive theory. Um, I think that it is sort of an overreach of executive privilege um, or overreach of a philosophy because we see in Article 2, Section 1, that executive power is vested in one president. And I think that executive privilege claims are most valid when they come uh, surrounding presidential deliberations. So when we look to presidential communications privilege. However, I do see the importance of deliberative process privilege, which extends not just to immediacy um, in the president's advisors, but also cabinet heads who have technical working knowledge um, to make distinctions and claims of executive privilege. Right, and the DC Circuit Court has drawn an important distinction between these two sides of the privilege coin in the um, Judicial Watch v. DOJ opinion, where it ruled that because the uh, attorney general was not using his role to directly advise the president, but instead making a smaller deliberative decision, that um, his 
documents were only subject to the deliberative process privilege and not the communications privilege, which is related directly to the president. Do you think the court got it right? Yes, I do. I think, um, as my colleague mentioned earlier, Article 2, Section 1 vests the executive power in a single president. Um, that draws on the Lockean idea of federative power, um, which vests the, the president and not the entire executive branch with uh, plenary power to make important decisions on national security. I also think it's important in that sense to keep accountability um, to much more a singular use and much more specific. If, if we see in the deliberative process, it's much more easily overcome when Congress needs to subpoena information. And so in order to keep this um, accountability that I believe the court ruled correctly. I would slightly disagree with my colleagues and say that occasionally, um, uh, executive privilege other than the communicative pri privilege has to be used, especially when dealing with interdepartments, um, uh, say the State Department dealing with the Department of Transportation or the Department of Homeland Security, those departments had communicating with each other should also have um, some privilege attached to it. Is there a difference between refusing to let the public know information and refusing to let Congress know information? Why should Congress ever be limited from knowing information that's relevant to uh, to the to the to the running of the government? Um, I would say that comes down to a separation of powers issue where presidential communications privilege um, is derived in order to, to maintain that balance and accountability. Right, Congress has also, or rather the Supreme Court has ruled in US v. Curtis Wright that the president has greater power aside from, um, separate from Congress when it comes to foreign policy and national security concerns particularly. And so in those matters, um, the president does have some powers that need to be kept away from Congress. And specifically, Congress has much more specific constitutional powers to keep things secret from uh, the public. We look to Article 1, Section 5. Congress has the right to, um, one, keep a journal of its proceedings, but also keep secret what it believes it needs to. OK. So it, it's such a complex time now with not only deliberate uh, dissemination of information, but then also keeping back information. Um, how is the public good and the common good served by the executive privilege, if at all? So it, it, I believe it is serves um, when it is in a extremely conservative sense. Um, so for example, the uh, public good is served with executive privilege um, during, uh, for example, active military operations, when the proceedings of said operations uh, and the necessity of them being kept secret is directly related to the health and well-being of U.S. soldiers. Um, and also in addition to the U.S. Uh, health and well-being of the U.S. soldiers, also the, um, the uh, completion of the mission often depends on the secrecy surrounding it. And we can also see if we draw back on Lockean principles that Locke himself believed that the head of state should have this prerogative that is supposed to help the public good. And so that would be helping what my colleague just mentioned. However, I do think that um, limitations um, and checking of executive privilege can also serve the common good. Um, we've seen in recent decisions such as Trump v. Vance that the um, court has been able to uh, check over broad interpretations of executive privilege um, and make sure that claims are relevant uh, to documents that concern legitimate uh, like national security or military diplomatic secrets instead of just personal information, which should not rise to that sort of claim. Okay, but Locke wrote that, he didn't tweet it. Uh, what's the impact of social media on uh, this, this whole concept of executive privilege? I think social media comes into this, um, but we can also go back to the roots of the privilege to, uh, to analyze the role of social media. Really the purpose is that um, the president should not be too worried about um, public perception and should be able to make, um, make decisions and weigh every available option without hesitations based on how he or she might be perceived for um, an option or an alternative that's not actually pursued. Social media makes that possibility even more dangerous um, and has been used as a justification by some presidents that um, because because public opinion is so um, all encompassing, it makes their job harder and necessitates more privilege. But in addition to this, when you're if uh, items that could be covered by executive privilege somehow make their way into the public, 
possibly through via social media, the press still has the right to uh, print said things. Like in New York Times, uh, the United States, the uh, New York Times came to uh, hold the documents that uh, the president and the White House didn't want them to print, but they still had to and could still have the ability to through their First Amendment uh, freedom of press rights. So what role should transparency play in this process? Shouldn't the public generally know a lot of the information that presidents suggest should be kept secret because of executive privilege? Uh, yes, the public should have the right to know um, many things that the president may be kept secret. For instance, um, this, this, there should be a distinction between what the president actually has to keep secret and versus what the president just wants to keep secret. Um, for, so for example, uh, the, like I said earlier, the military operations is something that the president absolutely has to keep secret to protect the lives of US soldiers. But something that the president just would want to keep secret, possibly an embarrassing, um, embarrassing facts about them during the presidency or a uh, demonstration of their potential incompetence uh, would just be something that they wouldn't want to be publicly known, but should be. Um, I would say that um, it, is, it is really important to have transparency and accountability and sort of coming back to, to rule of law even. Um, and I think that that is why it's important for um, there to be uh, sort of an ability to overcome claims of executive privilege um, in cases where, for example, uh, there is, it's a, it's a criminal case. Um, so if we look at, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I might have to disagree with my colleagues there. Um, as my colleague mentioned, criminal cases can be one arena in which it, the, the privilege is challenged, but I think that criminal cases have a much stronger case for overturning the privilege, whereas something like a Freedom of Information Act request from a private citizen is not as important because it doesn't have the constitutional purpose of Article 3 behind it, demanding that courts um, secure justice in criminal trials. So can executive privilege be uh, waived or should it be construed as waived if it's inadvertently, something's inadvertently disseminated by email? Uh, so if I believe that if uh, something is already public information um, or say that if something has already been released to the public in general, then executive privilege should not be able to apply it and it should be admissible in whatever proceedings uh, Congress uses or potentially admissible, admissible into criminal charges brought against uh, someone, a member of the executive branch. I disagree somewhat. I don't think that executive privilege as a whole should just be negated, but I think it should be on a case by case basis, maybe if it um, found out specific information, but executive privilege sh should still be able to be claimed on other information relating to it. All right, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Virginia. Um, I, I like how you started off with the crown privilege, you know, and an energetic, um, executive and kind of took us through the period of time starting with George Washington, but then brought us up and talked about uh, some information we've not heard yet, uh, including President Bush. I think that your um, knowledge of an interplay is, it was really good and you weren't afraid to take a position at certain points when we were testing you. Um, and I think that uh, the it's a difficult and complex question, and uh, you got down to money and appointments can check the president. And I think that it's um, simple and effective, and not everyone thinks of that. Um, so I enjoyed it, and I also enjoyed how you kept tying it back to John Locke. Um, it, it showed not only case law, then you you know, the different aspects of the Constitution, but then you really kept bringing in kind of um, support, evidentiary support of from Locke. And um, it's a subject we're going to grapple with for a long time. And uh, you did a good job of grappling with it today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. I thought you did a very good job. I liked where you started with the energetic executive within presented a more nuanced view. Uh, the the fact that executive power has grown over time, uh, but that uh, there there are some things that Congress can do. Uh, I thought it was important that you also realize that 
the executive branch is not homogeneous, that we run into yes. problems when, when uh, the, uh, the attorney general, just to pick a random example, might, might take a position that would uh, not allow checking the executive there. Uh, interesting use of the unitary executive theory in response to my question. And, uh, but all in all, I thought a very good presentation, very good discussion, very much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, I, I agree. Obviously the opening was, was very strong. You, you start, like I suggested, you start with the energetic executive and from there, you kind of had to pull back a little bit because there's a recognition that that could take you down the path of, of, of essentially, well, not fascism, but it could take you down the path of having an executive who, who is completely in control of, of information, which is a, which is a problem. So good job sort of, sort of pulling back and talking about balance. The only thing that I would, would, would say, and you've probably heard it, heard it before is it's okay to disagree with the court. The, the court, isn't always right. The court doesn't always agree with itself. So feel free uh, as the years roll by to just say, yeah, this is what the court said. And either I agree with it because I think they got it right, or I just don't think it's consistent with what in theory has occurred before. All right. So, so pieces along, along those lines are interesting. Uh, one last piece is, is it's, it's very interesting. You started with national security matters and Washington and St. Clair's defeat. And the idea that Washington originally said, I'm keeping this quiet, and then he eventually caved, which is a, which is a real interesting concept of, yes, yeah, sometimes even the president, even George Washington will realize, maybe this isn't working the way I thought it would work, even in a matter that was arguably related to national security, uh, national security matters and, and military. But not surprisingly, I thought it was very, very strong. A very, very strong performance, very, very strong discussion. And it would have been nice if we could have kept it going even longer, but time gets in the way. So good job, folks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well